They're trying to follow that, but it's a little bit hard to tell. Again, it is 2.30 in the morning in Kabul, and uh, Nick Robertson continues to watch there. Now let's turn to Judy Woodruff for us in Washington. Judy. Joey, we are in the studio in Washington, but of course riveted uh, to these pictures uh, coming out of Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, with me in the studio watching former United States Defense Secretary William Cohen and uh, Republican Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah. Uh, both, I want to ask both of you about what's going on. Let me begin with you, uh, Secretary Cohen. Is this something that is likely to be the United States retaliating, which is what I think immediately comes to people's minds? I think we have to be very uh, cautious in coming to that uh, judgment, Judy. Um, what we're looking at now is the United States gathering uh, information and intelligence. Obviously, there are many plans and contingency plans uh, that we have to deal with uh, responding uh, to any potential uh, terrorist threat that might be in the offing again. But I think it's uh, very premature to make any judgment on this. This could be a part of the civil war that's been raging on for some time. And so I think we have to wait to get more information. What do you mean part of a civil war? Well, there's been a civil war raging in uh, Afghanistan for some time now. And this could be simply uh, the factions still carrying on their fighting in, uh, in Kabul uh, rather than any kind of attack being launched by the United States. Are you saying, uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, that it's unlikely that the United States would move this quickly? Uh, I'm asking that because just a few minutes ago I was interviewing former Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger and he said flat out what the United States needs to do is strike against countries like Afghanistan that are harboring terrorists and not wait to find out exactly who was responsible for today's atrocities. Well, I think we do have to uh, isolate uh, and ostracize those countries like Afghanistan and others who are on the terrorist list who will give a uh, safe harbor uh, for, for terrorists. But I think we have to be a little more uh, judicious uh, rather than simply striking out. We have to get uh, more information and uh, further strikes might be uh, warranted. But at this point, I think we get all the information, then make a very uh, cold, ice cold decision in terms of what uh, we need to do to protect the American people and make sure that this uh, doesn't happen again. But I think that uh, may be a bit premature at this point. Senator Hatch, again, we're stressing we have no idea who's behind these attacks in Kabul, uh, the uh, government uh, center of Afghanistan. But if this were the West, if this were the United States, would it be appropriate to retaliate so quickly? Well, we have some information. You know, about a month ago, we had information that, there were, uh, that they were planning on some big strikes, people who were affiliated or associated with bin Laden. Then uh, just today, uh, we've intercepted some information where some people who are associated with bin Laden basically said that uh, they had uh, hit two targets. So it looks to me like uh, there's, uh, there's increasing evidence, even though it's fragmentary and even though it's not positive, that uh, bin Laden uh, is behind all this. And of course, uh, I first warned the nation in 1996 on Meet the Press right. that we better get hold of bin Laden or he's going to kill Americans. We're going to bring back our Nick Robertson there on uh, the ground in, or I should say on top of a building there in Kabul. Nick, uh, you're on. Go. They believe an ammunition dump is located in that area. That, of course, would account for some of the explosions that we've been hearing here as ammunition has detonated and gone off from that location, Judy. Yeah. Certainly it's all quiet here in Kabul right now. Certainly no more explosions are being heard around the city. The situation has been reversed. Now they're saying that it is not a U.S. strike. We are not retaliating. It is, in fact, part of the civil war that has been going on in that country for some time. So this is not a U.S. strike. We have not attacked Afghanistan. Okay, John Rowland, thank you very much. Secretary of Defense. Into the, the Pentagon were destroyed when hijacked airliners were deliberately crashed into buildings there. Rescue officials predict that hundreds, if not thousands, have died in today's attacks. One tower, the World Trade Center, was hit at 8.48 a.m. East Coast time this morning. Officials believe it was hit by an American Airlines Boeing 767 flying from Boston to L.A. The hijacked plane, Flight 11, had 81 passengers, nine crew members, and two pilots on board. About 18 minutes later, as emergency crews were rushing to the scene, a second airliner flew into the other tower, the World Trade Center. Officials believe this hijacked plane was United Airlines Flight 175, again from Boston to L.A., with 56 passengers on board, two pilots, and seven crew members. About 10 a.m. Eastern Time, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. By then, authorities had closed down the tunnels and bridges leading into the island of Manhattan, and the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, had ordered all U.S. airports closed. 
The North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed at 10.29 a.m. New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani, while not speculating on the final death toll, has told reporters it may be, quote, more than any of us can bear, end quote. Rescue crew is still on the scene. A smaller building, part of the World Trade Center complex, collapsed this afternoon. That's building number seven, part of a larger complex connected to the World Trade Center. The National Guard mobilizing all troops in the New York City area, but New York's tragedy, only part of that story. As we look at other parts of the country now. Millions and military people, acts that have killed and maimed many innocent and decent citizens of our country. I extend my condolences to the entire Department of Defense families, military and civilian, and to the families of all those throughout our nation who lost loved ones. I think this is indeed a reminder of the, tragic, the tragedy and the tragic dangers that we face day in and day out, both here at home as well as abroad. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. Chairman. Chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, Carl Levin. Our intense focus on recovery and helping the injured and the families of those who were killed is matched only by our determination to prevent more attacks and matched only by our unity to track down, root out, and relentlessly pursue terrorists, states that support them, and harbor them. They are the common enemy of the civilized world. Our institutions are strong, and our unity is palpable. Senator John Warner. Thank you. As a past chairman, uh, preceding Carl Levin, I can assure you that the Congress stands behind our president, and the president speaks with one voice for this entire nation. This is indeed the most tragic hour in America's history, and yet I think it can be its finest hour, as our president and those with him, most notably our Secretary of Defense, our chairman, and the men and women of the armed forces all over this world uh, stand ready not only to defend this nation and our allies against further attack, but to take such actions as are directed in the future in retaliation for this terrorist act, a series of terrorist acts unprecedented in world history. We call upon the entire world to step up and help because terrorism is a common enemy to all. And we're in this together. The United States has borne the brunt, but who can be next? Step forward and let us hold accountable and punish those that have perpetrated this attack. Again, I commend the secretary, the chairman, and how proud we are. We spoke with our president here moments ago. He's got a firm grip on this situation and the secretary and the general have a firm grip on our armed forces and in communication of the world over. Thank you very much. We'll take a few questions and uh, then we'll adjourn. Charlie. Mr. Secretary, did you have any inkling at all in any way that something of this nature and something of the scope might be planned? Uh, Charlie, we, we don't discuss intelligence matters. I see, and, how, and how, how would you respond if you find out who did this? The, uh, obviously, the President of the United States has spoken on that subject, and those are issues that he will address in good time. Mr. Yes. Secretary, we are getting reports uh, from CNN and others that there are bombs exploding in Kabul, Afghanistan. Are we at the moment striking back, and if so, is the target Osama bin Laden and his organization? I've seen those reports. Uh, they, in no way is the United States government connected to those explosions. 
What about Osama bin Laden? Do you suspect him as the prime suspect in this? Um, it's 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 not the time for discussions like that. Mr. Secretary, you said you could not be specific about casualties. Can you give us some characterization of whether it's dozens or hundreds in the, in the building? Well, we know there were large number, many dozens in the aircraft that flew at full power, uh, steering directly into the, between I think the first and second floor of the, uh, uh, opposite the helipad. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, it, there, there cannot be any survivors. It, it just would be beyond comprehension. The, um, there are a number of people that they've uh, not identified by name, but identified as being uh, dead, and uh, there are a number of casualties. But uh, we're, the FBI has secured the site, and the um, Information takes time to come. People have been uh, lifted out and taken away in ambulances, and uh, the the numbers will be calculated, and it will not be a few. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, could you tell us what you saw? Mr. Secretary, do you consider what happened today? We're looking also at a picture while we listen to the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld of helicopters no that we believe uh, are returning to the White House from Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, Marine uh, One uh, is the helicopter that has the President on board and lands on the south lawn of the White House, which is the routine procedure when the President returns uh, to the White House from Andrews Air Force Base. These are helicopters that we're now seeing approaching the south lawn of the White House. Uh, that's a picture of downtown Washington that you're seeing right now. So after Secretary Rumsfeld finishes his briefing at the Pentagon, a number of Bush administration cabinet officials will brief here at the White House to bring us up to date on the activities of their agencies. One, we're told, the Health and Human Service Secretary, Tommy Thompson, who is involved, of course, in the medical help, blood banking and others. So he will bring us up to date on his agency. Attorney General John Ashcroft, also on his way to the White House as well, we are told, all of this leading up, all these briefings from administration cabinet members leading up to a nationally televised address from the president tonight to the American people from the Oval Office. You see there Marine One sitting on the south lawn of the White House, a virtual ghost town throughout much of the day as it was evacuated. The president now back in Washington and at the White House. We'll John, uh, the trips to Louisiana and Nebraska that the president took today, that, that was designed, we're told, and we see a Marine officer uh, uh, walking off Marine One as the president we expect uh, to emerge from Marine One any second now. Uh, we assume that was because uh, security personnel thought it was too dangerous for the president to come right back to Washington, is that right? The first stop at Barksdale in Louisiana was designed so the president could get to a command and control center that is fortified and structured so that he could be in contact. You see the president there emerging from Marine One, saluting his Marine escort on the south lawn of the White House. The direction he turned, it appears he is heading straight into the Oval Office. Had he gone straight, that is the path into the White House residence. The president turning left, indicating he will go straight into the, his office, the Oval Office. The president saying nothing as he walks by there. The first stop was to get him to a command and control facility so that he could have secure conversations with the vice president who is here at the White House and with the National Security Council. At that point, we had been led to believe by some sources the president directly back to Washington. Then they took him to the headquarters of the Strategic Air Command for another briefing with the National Security Council amid some concerns that they wanted to run a few more security checks before bringing the president back to Washington. Obviously, one of the heinous acts we saw today on the Pentagon just a few miles away, so an enormous amount of security concerns. Even as we speak here on the grounds of the White House, you see the president here heading up into the path, being greeted by more agents and his senior staff into the Oval Office. We will expend every effort and devote all the necessary resources to bring the people responsible for these acts, these crimes, to justice. Now is the time for us to come together as a nation to offer our support our prayers for victims and for their families, for the rescue workers, for law enforcement officials, for every one of us that has been changed forever by this horrible tragedy. The following is a summary of the known facts surrounding today's incidents. American Airlines Flight 11 departed Boston for Los Angeles, hijacked by suspects armed with knives. This plane crashed into the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 departed Boston for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 77 departed Washington Dulles for Los Angeles, 
was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93, departed Newark for San Francisco, was hijacked and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Crime scenes have been established by the federal authorities in New York, in Washington, D.C. area, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, and in Newark. The full resources of the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the U.S. Marshals Service, the Bureau of Prisons, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Office of Justice Programs are being deployed to investigate these crimes and to assist survivors and victim families. Thousands of FBI agents in all of the field offices across the country and in the international legat offices assisted by personnel from other Department of Justice agencies are cooperating in this investigation. The FBI has established a website where people can report any information about these crimes. That address is www.ifccfbi.gov. That address again, www.ifccfbi.gov. Individuals can report any information they know about these crimes to that website. It takes courage for individuals to come forward in situations like this, and I urge anyone with information that may be useful and helpful to authorities to use this opportunity. The Office of Victims of Crime has established a toll-free 800 number for family and friends of victims. They can call 800-331-0075 to leave contact information for a future time when more information is available to find out information about a victim or to find out information about the rights of victims and the services available to victim survivors and victim families. The determination of these terrorists will not deter the determination of the American people. We are survivors and freedom is a survivor. A free American people will not be intimidated nor will we be defeated. We will find the people responsible for these cowardly acts, and justice will be done. Um. And we will speak with one voice to condemn these attacks, to comfort the victims and their families, to commit our full support to the effort to bring those responsible to justice. We, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, stand strongly united behind the President and will work together to ensure that the full resources of the government are brought to bear in these efforts. Our heartfelt thoughts and our fervent prayers are with the injured and the families of those who have been lost. We know as a nation, as we said, our thoughts and prayers are with those families and those injured and those who are the casualties of today's attack. We also remember those thousands of people who are rescue workers. We ask now that we all bow our heads in a moment of silence and remembrance.
A display of bipartisan unity at this critical moment in U.S. history. It seemed like a spontaneous uh, singing of God Bless America. NYPD about. trucks coming by, coming out of the scene right now. A Pace University again is a triage center as the workers continue the rescue and the recovery operation. You can see the smoke is still coming out from the World Trade Center area and also at Beekman Hospital at their emergency center. The situation there, it continues to be full of tension, yet at the same time, uh, they tell us full of hope. We spoke with a, with a surgeon there just a few minutes ago uh, who confirmed for us, for us and we asked him that uh, what the situ was, situation was as far as being confirmed that it was a temporary morgue. Well, he did say the city has asked them to make provisions to act as a temporary morgue if need be. Let's update you on the situation here as far as the hospital is concerned. They have admitted about 300 victims. They say three have perished. Also, they say that um, the nature of the injuries tend to be exhaustion, being overwhelmed, smoke inhalation being uh, suffered by the, the rescue workers, fire police and EMS. Uh, they're saying that again, they expect another wave of people to perhaps to come in. Uh, actually, they're saying that they're standing by and hoping that victims are coming out of this scene that can be treated. They say right now that does not look like that may be the situation as they continue to work round the clock here, not only at Beekman, but also at Pace University. So we'll continue to keep you posted of the situation as it develops. Now let's go to see what the doctor says. There's a piece of things that you see in war. What have some of those people told you, perhaps, while they're being treated, their reactions? What have they said? Mostly disbelief. People had no idea of why or how something happened. In America, we take our freedom very nonchalant. We take it for granted. No one ever thought this would happen here. We had heard word unofficially this perhaps part of this area would be turned into a temporary morgue. What can you tell us about that? very sad thought to even think about, but obviously there are many thousands of people who are in buildings. Rescue teams have no, ac no access to them at this time, and as time goes on, the likelihood of survivor, for anyone to survive in the face of such heat and destruction and weight, as time goes on, it's less likely that people will survive. Of course, we're all very hopeful, and there is likely to be pockets of of safety where people can wait and that's what we're hoping for we're all standing around hoping our frustration right now is and we've spoken to many hospitals that there is not a stream of injury coming out everyone is waiting there's a lot of damage and there's nothing for us to do terrorists on the planet the u.s government has put a five million dollar bounty on his head Osama bin Laden was last seen publicly this January at his son's wedding in Afghanistan. Rare pictures of a man who reportedly travels only at night, often in disguise, surrounded by bodyguards. He made his reputation in the 1980s, fighting the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. He um, was involved in some horrific battles, um, which he said later gave him a sort of tranquility and uh, a sense of peace. Um, and it basically made him a pretty fearless guy. Today, the Central Intelligence Agency calls him the most immediate and serious threat to U.S. security. Bin Laden says the jihad against the United States and killing of Americans is the core of his faith. He was born into a family of wealth, power, and privilege in Saudi Arabia 44 years ago. 
It was during his days as a student studying economics that he turned to radical Islam. He is linked to a series of global terrorist attacks. February 1993, the bombing of the World Trade Center in New York. Six dead, more than a thousand injured. August 7, 1998, the simultaneous U.S. Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, more than 200 killed. And last year, the suicide bomb attack on the USS Cole, resulting in the death of 17 American servicemen. He alone, probably within the Islamic world, has amassed and developed um, a terrorist network, in, an international network, which would be capable of carrying out such an atrocity. After the embassy bombing, the American government retaliated with missile strikes. The missiles damaged bin Laden's headquarters in Afghanistan, but he escaped unharmed. The U.S. has demanded that the radical Islamic government in Afghanistan hand bin Laden over to American authorities. But the Afghans have refused, despite bin Laden's declaration that all U.S. citizens are legitimate targets. He's targeted the U.S. because he sees America as the head of the snake, as he calls it. The body of the snake is the corrupt governments in the Middle East that he um, has promised to overthrow, and also Israel. Meanwhile, his popularity in the region is reportedly increasing. Recently, an estimated 25,000 followers scattered around the world and prepared to engage in a holy war against America. From Afghanistan tonight, a statement from the government claiming bin Laden didn't do it. Meanwhile, U.S. intelligence officials say he was last seen near Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan, but because he moves at least three times a week, he will remain difficult to catch. Tom? The horror and the, and the scale of the tragedy that we've witnessed, I, I, I'm going to pose this question to Jeff. You wonder if anyone can deliver a speech that is as big as what has happened. That's exactly right, I think, Paula, that, you know, when Reagan, President Reagan gave a speech after Challenger, that was an awful day. Six people died. It was a terrible accident. Even Oklahoma City, horrible as that was, was the contained act of one madman. This attack on the United States, which is not an overstatement, in some way makes words almost, uh, they may be, it's too much of a burden for almost any speech to bear. Yes, we want reassurance. Yes, we want resolve. Sure, we're going to get it. At the end of the day, you know, we still don't know how many people are dead because they can't even go into that rubble two and, miles from here. And, you know, Mayor Giuliani, Jeff, uh, late today, talked in terms of a week, maybe a week, before we really know how many people have perished in that building. It is a long time to wait. Uh, I, I, there were a lot of phone messages when I was downstairs earlier from people wanting to know the answer to that question, how many people have died today, and that is simply unknowable. And you know what, Aaron, that, unknowable. that makes that so hard to answer is that city officials can't even get in within that perimeter area. There is still debris falling from uh, these collapsed buildings, uh, and uh, there are an untold number of people still trapped. And, and we know that, that there are a couple of hundred firefighters who are missing. There are 78 New York police officers, uh, officers who are missing. And nobody down there, 30 or so blocks away from where we are, wants to see that number go up. So they will wait, they will wait until they, the building is as safe as it might get. It will never be safe to go in there. There will always be risk, but the risk will mitigate a bit over time, and then they will slowly start to go into the building, start to search for who may still be there, and but that's that why days away. And we that's why the president. Excuse me, but that's why the president's speech tonight has such a burden upon it. The stark reality of that makes what the president has to say tonight as difficult, probably as difficult a speech as any president, at least since Roosevelt's day of infamy. Probably speech. Probably since Roosevelt. This what? is one of those moments. The president now, uh, just a few moments away from addressing the nation. Uh, from the Oval Office, uh, he has not been back in Washington for very long. But now, from the Oval Office, the President to talk about the extraordinarily horrible events of September 11th. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. 
The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat, but they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. Anyway, she was a special lady. We will all miss her. I can't imagine doing one of our panel debates and not having Barbara Olson. And to, to her wonderful husband, Ted, the condolences of all of us here at CNN. We'll be back tomorrow night. Stay tuned for a CNN special report, America Under Attack. <laughs>
was the second tower that collapsed uh, earlier today. You can see the antenna on uh, top of it. That antenna used for the transmission of a lot of television signals. The, uh, many of the TV stations uh, were out of commission for a while today. You can see a wide shot of the city. As you can see, the dust that uh, is now coating parts of today. A hijacked jet ripped through one of the World Trade Center's 110-story towers. That was the first attack there. Minutes later, another jet tore through the second tower, as you see in that dramatic image. Both towers crumbled to the ground in a cloud of smoke and debris. Today, businesses, schools, and stock markets are closed. And meanwhile, in Washington, the site of another attack, authorities say as many as 800 employees may have been killed after another hijacked plane slammed into the Pentagon. It will be closed to all but essential personnel today. Most federal offices will be open for business. Congress will convene. The FAA is expected to keep all commercial flights grounded until at least noon today. We are watching that one very closely. About this time yesterday, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida, at a school talking about his education plan. To say what a difference a day makes is a bit trite, I guess. The president last night, in a very stern speech from the Oval Office, brief but stern, said he would make no distinction between the terrorists and those who harbor them. You have said that the attacks yesterday constituted an act of war and the United States will treat this as if it is a war. What does that mean? It means that we'll use our full resources to go after those who are responsible for this. And it is not uh, an action that will be over in a week or two. This has got to be a full-scale assault, not just by the United States, but by the civilized community against terrorism. And it has to be fought on the political front, it has to be fought on the diplomatic front, the military front, and the intelligence front. And we are deeply encouraged by the responses we have received so far from international organizations, but especially from countries around the world who have expressed solidarity with us and who have come to the realization, I hope, that all of us have to respond to this because none of us is safe from this kind of attack. You have said our rather... Hearts, our hearts go out to those who lost their lives. This is a tragedy for our nation, but at the same time, we are a strong nation, we are a resilient nation, and we will come through this, and people will see what America is really capable of doing and capable of responding to. Mr. Secretary, I know you have said that you will go after whoever is responsible for perpetrating these attacks. You will also go after those who might have harbored uh, others and involved in this attack. Where are you in the process of determining who was behind these attacks yesterday? The intelligence community is hard at work, the CIA, the FBI, and other agencies assembling uh, information, uh, doing forensic work on, uh, uh, at the two sites yesterday, and a uh, body of evidence will be developed in the days ahead. And I don't think it'll take too long, but uh, that process is well underway, but we don't do we don't want to start speculating or making a judgment now before we actually have the evidence. Mr. Secretary, Senator Orrin Hatch was saying this morning that U.S. intelligence actually intercepted communications between Osama bin Laden supporters discussing the attacks. What can you tell us about these intercepted communications? We should not be talking about intelligence methods used by the United States of America. All we do is put them at risk, so we should not be talking about such things, and I will not. Are you suggesting that Senator Orrin Hatch has been irresponsible in, in we should not floating be talking this information? We should not be talking about how the United States collects information in cases such as this. Well, let me move on to this. What kind of group or, or groups do you think actually have the sophistication to pull off an attack of this magnitude? It has to be a group that... Uh, one has money, two has, uh, I think, a significant number of adherents, members. It has to have a network. It has to have the ability to move people around the world. So it is quite a sophisticated organization with a very sophisticated planning and execution capability. And uh, I think the fingerprints are, are quite clear that it has to be an organization with that level of, uh, of complexity associated to it. So it isn't your average uh, fly-by-night car bomber. This is a sophisticated outfit. Former Secretary of Defense William Cohen is saying this has uh, the blueprints of an attack by someone perhaps involved with Osama bin Laden. Can you rule Osama bin Laden out this morning? 
we rule no one out, and uh, we will be ruling uh, the perpetrators in in uh, the near future, I'm quite sure. One last quick question. Can you explain how four hijackers were able to take over four airliners yesterday? No, I cannot. Um, obviously, we need to do more with respect to security at our airports. We need to do more with respect to uh, tracking people within a society that is an open society. And we have to do it in a way that protects us, but at the same time, uh, does not cause us to be a closed society, to be the kind of society that would not be reflective of American values. And all of those uh, issues are under consideration this morning and are being studied by various uh, members of the administration. Secretary Powell, uh, good of you to join us. We, we know you, uh, how taxing of... Uh, yesterday. yesterday at this time, everything was completely normal where I'm standing, right next to where the World Trade Center complex used to stand. People were going to work. People were walking into the World Trade Center complex, many of them for the very last time ever. What we're being told right now by authorities, they're updating the information to us, that six firefighters and one police officer have been rescued in the early morning hours. We're told the one police officer was seriously burned, but seven different emergency officials have been rescued this morning. Last night, two police officers were rescued, so a total of nine people according to medics and emergency officials we talked to, have been rescued right now, and there is hope that at least two more are in the process of being rescued as we speak. But right now I stand here on Church Street, just north of where the two 110-story buildings used to stand, and emergency officials are going in and out. We just saw uh, about two minutes ago two incinerated cars brought out in the back of a flat truck. You couldn't even recognize that they were cars. They were completely melted. On the streets are a couple of inches thick of dust and grime and dirt that have flown from the buildings over the last 24 hours since this terrible accident happened. And one thing you have to keep in mind about this, these you keep hearing these were huge office buildings. These were like cities. 50,000 people work inside these buildings. Two 110-story buildings. That's 220 stories of buildings in this complex. It was a huge megaplex. The bottom level itself of the World Trade Center complex had a subway station, also had a train station called the PATH station that stands for Port Authority Trans Hudson. It took New Jersey commuters to New York City every day. And then a shopping mall with dozens of stores and restaurants. On the bottom level alone, there are thousands of people, and we're talking about 220 stories. So it really shows you the terrible horror of all this. Gary, all about before you, you go, yeah, Gary, before you go any further, I think I need to clarify that the statistics at the bottom of our screen right now actually can't keep up with the information you are reporting. Once again, you are confirming that in fact six, seven survivors have been found, right? Six firefighters, one police officer. One thing I want to stress, Paula, oftentimes we are not comfortable with facts unless we see them with our own eyes. We have a lot of very nervous, very anxious, very sad very traumatized emergency officials coming out and giving us this information. They, they tell us they are sure that there are six firefighters, one police officer rescued early this morning. We haven't seen it with our own eyes. We are taking their words for it, and that literally is all we can do because we are not allowed right next to the scene right now. But that is what emergency officials are telling us. Six firefighters, one police officer rescued this morning, two police officers rescued last night for a total of nine. All right. I, I, I think I need to mention that because I think these numbers are going to conflict uh, throughout the day. You are closer uh, to the uh, pool of information than anyone, and we're going to rely on, on your numbers. Gary? It began just about 24 hours ago when the first airliner slammed into one of the World Trade Center towers, American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to Los Angeles was the intended itinerary. There you see the impact on the first tower, the North Tower, the World Trade Center. These are some late pictures we received overnight showing the attack from a slightly different angle. The huge fireball erupted as the jet tore through the building. Now, 18 minutes later, we have several angles on this attack. The second plane, this is a United Airlines Flight 175, also Boston, Los Angeles, its intended itinerary. It ripped into the South Tower. Both towers later collapsed into piles of rubble the rubble we've been showing you all this morning. These are the dramatic scenes as the clouds of gray smoke enveloped lower Manhattan, causing a virtual stampede of rescue workers, members of the media who had responded to the scene. As the heroic search and rescue effort unfolds, an American flag stood amid the devastation. Those individuals who need assistance right now, either temporary housing, 
or emergency cash, I would urge those individuals who have been affected directly by this tragedy to call our 800 number, 462-9029, 800-462-9029. Um, if you need immediate assistance, identifying those folks are going to be a difficult challenge. But more importantly, we need to get to those individuals who are still alive in the building, in the rubble, and we'll do that. And the most encouraging news, uh, Mr. Albaugh, is that our Gary Tuckman is reporting that six firefighters right. have been rescued, one police officer in addition to two police officers uh, last night, bringing the total of the nine uh, victims okay. rescued from the rubble of the World Trade Center. And that, and that gives us hope for others that will be alive, which has to be our focus. And I know everyone's doing their best to get to those individuals as quickly as they can. Mr. Albaugh, thank you very much for your I'm a local uh, fire chief. Uh, the Pentagon officials, in fact, say that that figure is probably uh, way higher than it's going to be, but they acknowledge that uh, it could be in the hundreds. As a matter of fact, they've already recovered some bodies. We haven't been told how many. Uh, police say that uh, they're blocking one roadway around here because a temporary mortuary has been set up there. We're told that even with the fire still smoldering, uh, some uh, search teams went in overnight, that there are search dogs who are here. They're going to determine when they can go in again. Of course, there have been flames that have erupted sporadically, and that has slowed things down. Now, it is shortly after 8 o'clock in the morning in Washington, and at 8 o'clock, part of the Pentagon opened up work. It was very important to the defense secretary that he show the world that this building, in spite of the, the catastrophe that occurred yesterday, in spite of that, that the Pentagon would be up for business. But only about half of it could be open because there were concerns that uh, the structural damage that might have occurred in the other parts of the building would make things uh, too difficult and too dangerous for the other people. But at 8 o'clock, the Pentagon opened up. Uh, it was very important, officials said, that the press office be open so reporters could locate there. CNN has a team there where we, of course, cover what's going on out here. And what's going on out here is the search, the very grim search, to find out just how many people became victims of this terrorist act. Paula? Bob, is there any new information about the flight that went down outside of Pittsburgh and, and what the uh, ultimate target was supposed to have been? Well, it's, it's more speculation than information. There was some talk uh, early on, according to briefings that were held uh, for congressional leaders, according to Capitol Hill sources, some talk that the target was Camp David, but that's really given short shrift. There is other belief, though, that either the White House or, more likely, the U.S. Capitol was going to be a target. What they don't know is why the plane did not, in fact, continue. That's one of the mysteries that's going to uh, uh, have to be sorted out. Of course, there's so many. That is just one. All right, Bob, one last question for you before we move on. Secretary of State Powell was on the air with me uh, a short while ago and uh, seemed to indicate that he was upset. That might not be the right word, but uh, that Orrin Hatch is saying that U.S. intelligence actually intercepted communication uh, between some uh, bin, uh, almost Osama bin Laden supporters discussing the attack. How sensitive of an issue is that there this morning? Well, uh, there, of course, is going to be a real reappraisal as things go on. Uh, another way to put that will be second-guessing. Uh, people are going to look back and say, why didn't we act on X information or Y information? And apparently there were indicators out there. We've talked to newspaper editors, we being CNN, around the world uh, about uh, the warnings that had been issued. Of course, there have been so many warnings over time by uh, various terrorist organizations that sometimes it's difficult for intelligence officials to figure out which ones were real. And of course, they sadly now realize this one was very tragically real. What happened with some of those Palestinians, and I hope that that reaction is not, is, is not just universally broadcast over the entire Arab world. There has been a feeling of such frustration in the Arab world for many years, particularly among uh, Palestinians that this gives them a sense of a greater power, perhaps, than they have ever known before. But is that reflected in the larger Arab world? I cannot believe that it is, and I'm sure if and when you speak to King Abdullah, that will be the point that he wants to make above any and all others. Well, I think we're going to do that just now, and I believe if we have our satellite working, we have with us now His Majesty King Abdullah of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Let me see if we can get the picture up. Your Majesty, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. I want to turn to the question I was just raising with Ted Koppel. We did watch in this country those scenes of 
celebration by Palestinians in various places in the Middle East. How are Americans to react except with horror and anger? Well, ma'am, I believe that uh, we were equally horrified by uh, what we saw on the television in the past uh, several hours. But again, I, I sincerely believe that uh, those that were demonstrating or celebrating are a very, very uh, select few individuals that uh, are really no reflection on uh, the Palestinian people and the rest of the Arab world. Um, and um, uh, obviously, uh, anybody who condones uh, violence or is, uh, is, is, sees joy on, on, on seeing uh, innocent people uh, being hurt uh, and uh, maimed or killed, uh, there must be something terribly wrong with them. But there's definitely not a reflection of uh, the people of the Middle East. And uh, it completely defies the principles of the three Malthusian religions, uh, including Islam. Your, Your Majesty, I'd also like to ask you about what Secretary of State Colin Powell said to us this morning, that yes, there will be a brand new kind of response now to what has happened. But he said key to it is the reaction of the moderate Arabic states in the Middle East, and that, of course, means Jordan. If the United States decides to retaliate in Afghanistan on the Taliban, who are the, the harborers of Osama bin Laden, not just Osama bin Laden, will you support that action? Well, I think uh, that the question is, is that um, for many years now, there's been a call by the international community to work closer together uh, to combat terrorism. And uh, I don't think we've been as efficient as we should have been, uh, as awful as, uh, as the events were yesterday. Uh, I'm sure that after the Americans deliberate and, and look at their, uh, um, um, uh, the possibilities that they have ahead of them to, to be able to um, uh, punish those that were responsible for the crimes, uh, I think the United States and the international community will come together once and for all to try and rid uh, the world of this menace. But there is a, an angry nation here in the United States, and, and I, I do wonder Absolutely. what is going to happen with the moderate Arab states, your country, uh, Your Majesty, Egypt, uh, for instance, if there is U.S. military retaliation. Well, again, I think you have to understand, and, and your government can um, explain it better than we can, that um, uh, many of the Arab countries have been working over the past many years uh, together in combating terrorism, and Jordan in particular. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a responsibility that uh, we all have, and uh, we will continue to uh, work with our friends, uh, especially the Americans, uh, during this crisis uh, to make sure that uh, they get the necessary support. So would you assist in military action? Well, uh, Jordan is a very small country. Um, uh, I, I presume that the Americans are, are far more capable of being able to uh, take their objections themselves, but um, there is an international network uh, of uh, intelligence organizations that work together to combat terrorism, and Jordan has been a, a great provider of being able to work uh, within that system. Your Majesty, just before we let you go, just on a practical note, you were on your way to the United States yesterday, right? When uh, this occurred and your plane had to turn back? Yeah, yes, sir. We were halfway over the Atlantic when we, we heard the terrible news. Uh, part of uh, me wanted to, to continue to the United States to uh, send moral support to, 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 to uh, um, the American people, but we understood that obviously the government and the federal agencies would be so busy with the, the sadness of what has uh, taken place. And uh, really this tragic event, just uh, we joined the international community in extending the sorrow and grief that uh, we all feel towards the American people, and in particular, uh, the families of the victims uh, of this uh, horrible, horrible uh, travesty that we witnessed yesterday. And understanding that, Your Majesty, when Americans talk about the fact that this is war, when the U.S. government talks about the fact that this is war and a whole new level of terrorism, what would you say to the American people about what they should now expect from terrorists around the world? Is, is it a brand new era that you see beginning yesterday? The, the fight between uh, the international community and uh, international terrorism uh, has been going on for, for decades uh, and uh, for the most part um, we have to give credit to uh, the international uh, intelligence agencies for the tremendous work they've been doing. Uh, it's a, it's an, uh, a battle that goes on every single day. 
Um, and you have to imagine that sooner or later the laws of averages are going to catch up with you and uh, um, the terrorists are going to win. Um, now you have to pick yourself up, as difficult as that is, dust yourself off and take the fight back to them again. Um, and we all have the, the moral resolve to, to make sure that we can read the, our uh, world of this menace um, and you just have to be determined. We have to hunker down um, and it's going to be a tough struggle because I think now uh, there will be a move by the international community to be a lot more serious about uh, combating this phenomenon. His Majesty King Abdullah, again, we are so grateful to you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we Thank should you. point out to everyone that, first of all, the Kingdom of Jordan does have a majority Palestinian population, but throughout the years, yes. we want to add that Jordan has been a great friend of the United States and in some very complicated situations, including the Gulf War. But George Stephanopoulos is here because you've got more news. Yeah, there's some various reports coming in on a number of fronts. Number one, ABC's Chris Vlasto has learned that the FBI knows that there were three hijackers on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon, and they actually know the names of the hijackers. Of course, they're not releasing them, but they're saying they have identified who the hijackers are. That would be American Flight 77 that had taken off from Dulles, uh, a 757 taken off from Dulles that was headed for Los Angeles and apparently circled sometime before, before it came back. Before going in, exactly. They know the names. They That's know the names. Yeah. Secondly, Governor Angus King of Maine has confirmed that two suspects in the attack on the World Trade Center flew to Boston through Portland International Airport in Maine, which helps confirm some of the other information we've been getting overnight. And they were apparently using New Jersey driver's licenses. So we're getting bits and pieces of information from, from lots of different places this morning. Finally, on, on another note, former President Bush yesterday was, was flying to Minnesota and he was forced to land in Wisconsin, was grounded in Wisconsin after the initial attacks. The FAA did that for security reasons. This was released by Governor Jeb Bush of, of Florida, and they are now not saying where President Bush is for security reasons right now. Remember back in 1993, former... Somebody just heard that quickly. For security reasons, they're not telling you where President Bush is. You're talking about former, former President, President Bush, right. exactly. Father Bush. Bush. Number 41, right, okay. as they say in the White House. And remember, there was an assassination attack against uh, former President Bush back in 1993. So for security reasons, he was grounded yesterday, now is in a secure location. And then finally, in a press conference overseas, the head of the Chancellor Minister of Germany has said that German intelligence agencies agree with France, Britain, and Israel that Saudi, um, that Osama bin Laden was probably behind these attacks. They cautioned they have no hard evidence but all of these intelligence agencies have consulted, and they say the signs are pointing towards Osama bin Laden. Which reminds me that we haven't heard directly from Saddam Hussein of Iraq. However, Iraqi newspapers were reported earlier this morning to be saying, and of course they are his mouthpieces, to be saying that the United States simply got what it deserved. Yeah, and we've seen some other indications in, in our world of that kind of, of reaction, but as you saw, King Abdullah is trying to tamp that down in his in his discussions here in the United States. Did you read anything into what he said about whether or not the moderate Arab states would go along well, it was, to support it was, U.S. military action? It was very interesting. Obviously, he, want, he didn't want to answer the question directly, but everything he said was true. Jordan is a very small state and wouldn't be able to contribute too much in, with military forces. On the other hand, they can do a great deal with intelligence sharing. Remember, during the Gulf War, they were in a tricky situation, and they often face a, a, a dilemma of whether or not to really close off their borders or to provide something of a black market to Iraq. And I think that's where he'll see some additional pressure, not only on supporting military action, but will he really go along with tight economic sanctions, the kinds that former Secretary William Cohen was talking about earlier. All right. Thanks very much, George Stephanopoulos. It is 9 o'clock here on the...